1 Corinthians chapter number 7, we'll begin in verse number 1. And the Bible reads here, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now this entire chapter is dedicated a lot to, first and foremost, the subject of marriage. It's also dedicating a good portion of the chapter talking about divorce. It talks about virgins and those who are single. And it has a lot of good concepts in here, a lot of good commandments and principles that we need to glean from. And in fact, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a chapter that a lot of churches try to stay away from, oh, yeah. trying to interpret. Yeah. Okay. And unfortunately, it's a chapter that a lot of people use who have gotten divorced or who want to get divorced. They try to use this chapter right here, kind of like the first Corinthians chapter six and verse number 10, yeah. kind of like the other verses that we looked at the last couple of weeks to prove something that's not biblical to basically try to get their way. Right. And we're going to interpret what it means here in first Corinthians chapter number seven. Verse number one, he says this. I'm going to read to you again. It says, now concerning things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Now, what is he talking about? Why does he start off the chapter talking about that? Well, go back to chapter number 6 and verse 16. We'll see the context here. And verse 16 says what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the chapter finishes off in chapter 6, basically calling us to holiness. Saying, look, hey, you need to run from fornication. Get away from that. Yeah. Don't be a part of fornication. Don't be a part of uncleanness. You're bought with the price. And then he says this, look, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Yeah. Now, why does he say that in context to fornication? Because at the end of the day, touching a woman ultimately leads to fornication. Yeah. He said, well, you know, I can contain myself, though. You know, I have self-control. I can give her a little kiss on the cheek and a little kiss on the lips. I can hold her hand and grab her by the waist. But you know what? Ultimately, it's going to lead to fornication. Yeah. That's why the Bible says it's good. For a man not to touch a woman. Good. Why? Because any red-blooded man is going to want to do more after that. Yep. When you hold the hand, when you grab the waist, it just leads to a closer relationship. Okay? So in chapter 6, we see the wickedness of fornication. He says, look, fornication is wicked. Now, fornication is a, is a big sin. In the Old Testament, it wasn't punishable by death. Adultery was. That was a crime in the, in the Bible. But nevertheless, fornication is still a wicked sin. Hold your place there. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And hold your place in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Fornication is still bad. And you know what? We need to hear more about fornication today. We need more churches to talk about it and scream it from the pulpits. Why? Because... It's rampant in our culture. It's all over the television. Movies promote it. Everyone talks about it. Everyone does it, and they don't even blush at it. You know, we, have, we live in a, in a country who's not ashamed to fornicate. And they're not ashamed to talk about it, to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. Okay? And the reason for that is because pastors aren't getting up and talking about it. They're not getting up and saying fornication. They're saying, well, you know, they're being a little loose, or they're being promiscuous. No, it's fornication. Amen. Now, in case you don't know what fornication is, it's the sexual relationship between two people who are not married, okay? Brother David, can, can you hit that AC? Thank you. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, and verse number 3, it gives us here the will of God. You know, people look for the will of God. They're like, man, I just want to know what God's will is. You know, I just want to know what God is calling me to do in my personal life. Well, here it is, okay? Here's step one. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So he's saying, you know what the will of God is for your personal life? Is that ye should abstain from fornication. Okay, and he says there, you should know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay, you ought to know what kind of standards you ought to set up in your personal life to keep you away from fornication. Yeah. You ought to know what kind of safeguards you ought to put in your personal life to possess your body in sanctification and in honor. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 
So we see that an essential part of doing God's will is not fornicating. It's very bad. It's wicked. Okay? And here's the thing. You can destroy your life by getting involved in this matter of fornication. You can destroy it. You say, well, you know, it's, it's with my girlfriend. Well, you know, how do you know your girlfriend doesn't have an STD? You don't know. You know, how do you know that the person you're with or the boyfriend you're with doesn't have HIV? You don't know that. Right. We don't know that. You know, how, how do you know what's going what's, what's gonna to stem from that? You know, there's a lot of emotional scars that people come out of when they commit fornication. Amen. A lot of emotional scars. It leaves them emotionally scarred for life at times. They can't even have a normal relationship with maybe their future spouse because of the experiences they've had in the past. Fornication can just ruin you. But you, know, but you know what? People just think it's, oh, we're just having fun. And you know, we got to test out the waters before we get in. No, it's wicked. Right. And look, God has a remedy for that. You see, God's not against a physical relationship. He's against a physical relationship outside of marriage. Yep. Okay? It's Satan who tries to promote fornication to make it seem as though it's, you know, oh, you know, if he, if, if he loves you or if you love him, you're going you're gonna to commit fornication with him. You know, that's the way you express your love. No, if he, if he loves you, He'll marry you. Amen. He will esteem you enough to put a ring on your finger, marry you, commit his life to you, and take care of you for the rest of your life, and not just use you like some whore. Okay? But the Bible, that's what the Bible tells us there, flee fornication. And you know what? Though this is a temptation for ladies, obviously it's a bigger, I think it's a bigger temptation for men. And it's telling us, hey, we need to be like Joseph. Amen. Or it's just like, you're running, you're leaving your God, you're doing whatever you can to get out of there. Because yeah. you know how bad it is. Okay? So in chapter 7, we see that in order to avoid fornication, people are supposed to get married. And he, this is the good thing about this is, you know, sometimes people have this view of God that's very misconstrued. They think, oh man, God is just full of all these rules and, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. But you know what? It's for our own good. Amen. And here's the thing. Not only is it for our own good, he often has a very, a, a better alternative, Amen. okay, which is marriage. You get married to one woman, you don't have to worry about any sexually transmitted diseases. You don't got to worry about having children out of wedlock. You don't got to worry about any of those things. You could be with that one person for the rest of your life and never have to worry about any of those things. You don't have to go to sleep at night with a guilty conscience knowing that you're, you're sinning, you're doing wrong. Okay? So it's a good thing. You know, God says, look, I understand. Look, I'm, by the way, he, he made us with these desires, but he wants us to go about it his way. And his way is the best way, okay? So it's for our own good. He provides us a godly alternative for that. Verse number two says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. This is the remedy for the epidemic of fornication in our country. But here's the thing. Instead of what do we have? We have youngsters and young people who don't want to get married. They just want to sleep around. They just, they, and why is that? Because they don't want to commit to an actual relationship, yeah, yeah. to commit to having a wife and working and taking care of her and bearing children and taking care of those children. Right. You know, all they want to do is have bastard children everywhere. You're like, oh, that's a, that, that's a bad word. It's a, it's a Bible word right. that just right. mean, that means fatherless. Yeah, okay? Right. And look, that's wicked. You know, you, you just want to fulfill your physical desires, which obviously is a legitimate desire, but you're fulfilling it in an ungodly way. Right. And the Bible says here, look, girls... Don't marry a guy who's not, who wants to fornicate with you before marriage. That just goes to show you what he thinks of you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? You say, well, you know, but, but I love him. You know, and he says that he loves me. If he's trying to get in your pants before marriage, he doesn't love you. Amen. Right. Bottom line, he loves your body. And look, you know what the difference between a prostitute and someone who commits fornication is? The one who commits fornication is doing it for free, right. which is even worse. Yeah. He's like, oh, man, that's disrespectful. You shouldn't say that. But it's, it's the truth. Yeah. You know, wouldn't you prefer someone who actually respects you? Wouldn't you prefer someone who loves you enough that they're willing to wait for you? They're willing to do what? They're willing to commit to taking care of you for the rest of their lives, to, for the rest of your life. That's honorable. Yeah. But we don't have that today. We have a bunch of youngsters who just want to sow their wild oats and just fornicate all over the place without the commitment. That's wicked. No. Don't be that kind of person. Don't be that kind of young person where it's just like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready for marriage, okay? And I don't want to get married. I just want to sleep around. And, and by the way, in our church, if you are involved in fornication, you're out Amen. of the church. Amen. That's cultish. No, the cults try to keep you in. Yeah. 
Okay, and I'm not, we're not the Baptist police. We're not looking around to see, hey, are you, you guys involved in something over there? Or what's going on over there? But you know, if we catch wind of something, obviously we're going we're gonna to confront you about it. And if you're not willing to repent of it, if you're not willing to get it right, then guess what? You got to go. Because a little leaven living at the whole lump. Yeah. And you know what? We have too many churches all across America that are tolerating fornication in their congregation oh, because they don't want to lose their new members. They don't want to lose the tithes. So what do they do? They just tolerate it. They disciple the people for four years. Yeah. And the people still haven't gotten out of fornication. Yeah. Yeah. There's something wrong with that. Yeah. You're destroying those people's lives. But allow, by allowing them to continue in fornication. Okay. Now, look at verse number three. So after they get, so now we're going to talk about after marriage, right? So before marriage, it's just like, hey, it's legitimate to have feelings for the opposite gender. But you know what? To avoid fornication, you guys need to get married. Yes. That's the option. Yep. And look. It's funny because, you know, my, my father-in-law used to say this. He used to say, I don't get young people, you know. Before marriage, they're just like all over each other. And then after marriage, they don't even want to touch each other anymore. And it's like, what's wrong with you people? You know, you guys got it backwards. Why? You know, now you have permission. Now you have God's blessing on your life. Now's the time to be holding hands and, you know, doing the things that married people do. Now, Look at verse 3. Get some instructions for people after they get married. It says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Now, what does benevolence mean? It means kindness. Okay, we're going to get into a little bit more. Hold your place here. Go to Ephesians chapter number 5. So it says, Look, the husband ought to be kind to his wife. Okay? And what's the opposite of being kind? Being mean, you know? In, 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 uh, in Spanish, we call it being a machista. All right, you guys know what that is? He's like, I'm the, I rule the house right here, you know. I, you do as I tell you, woman, you know, kind of thing. That's, that's, that's common in Hispanic culture. I don't know about any other cultures. I just know in Hispanic culture that's very common. But the Bible doesn't say we ought to, like, rule our house in such a way like a dictator. We run it as a benevolent dictatorship, but not as a dictator where we're just mean to our wives. You know, and, and here's the thing. The world and the feminists of the world, they look at marriages like ours and they, like, feel bad for my wife. And they're like, man, she's so enslaved and all this. I'm not mean to my wife. Yeah. My wife loves me for, for me to rule over her. Yeah, okay? Right. She loves it. Why? Because she knows that she has a leader who's not a weakling. Yeah. Yeah. You see, the women in the world who hate that is because they've been around men who are weaklings, yeah. who can't lead them. Yeah. Okay? And we need our country, specifically, obviously, in the churches, for men to grow up and be strong leaders. Yeah. Not be mean leaders. But be strong leaders. Amen. Leaders who, my father-in-law used to tell me this. He's like, leaders who can say, hey, grab my coattail. We're going somewhere for the Lord. Amen. Okay? Because a woman wants to be a part of someone's life who's doing something big for God. Right. Who knows where they're going. They're not, not perfect, but someone who knows where they're going in life. Okay? But it says there we need to be benevolent. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the, the clear command is this. Husbands, you need to love your wives. Okay? And obviously the, the, the command for the wife is to reverence her husband. Respect him. So let me get on both of these real quick, okay? So what does it mean to love your wife? You know, don't be bitter against them. Amen. You know, I know no one here would ever be bitter against their wife or anything like that for anything they do. But you know what the Bible says? We ought to love them. What does that mean? We kind of have to, like, over, overlook their flaws, in a sense of maybe if they, if they do disrespect us or if they fall short of what we consider to be the standard, we need to overlook that and be patient, be long-suffering, and love them. Amen. Okay. Now, on the flip side of that, what does the wife have to do? The wife obviously has to love the husband, but you know what? God doesn't have to command a wife to love her husband. That kind of comes naturally for them. What God has to command them to do is to reverence her husband. What is that? Respect the husband. Okay. Now, you say, well, how does that look like practically? Well, respect means to reverence, means to follow him. It means to respect his decisions. It's to respect his authority, okay? And here's the thing. Here's a good place to start. Don't disrespect your husband. Here's another start. Don't disrespect your husband in public, okay? I've seen marriages, I'm talking about Christian marriages, where the wife just like puts her husband down in public like all the time. And she wonders why, and look, the, that's obviously the husband's fault. 
because the dude needs to get some stones and just like man up. Okay. But here's the thing. It takes two to tango. Okay. And the wife, like, was just like, well, he doesn't know enough Bible. And, you know, he, he needs to get right with God and, you know, and all these things. I had a lady call me one time. She's like, where's your church? And yeah, I want to come to Faith Forward. Are you guys post-trib? It's like, we're, we're called Faith Forward Baptist. Of course we're post-trib. Are you guys replacement theology? You know, do you guys go soul winning? It's like, yeah, we're a church plant from Faith Forward Baptist Church in, in Tempe. We're basically, we're like the same church. The only difference is Pastor Anderson is not here. I'm the one who's here. I'm the one who preaches on a weekly basis. And then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, maybe she's a single mom. Maybe, you know, she's, you know, she, the husband's not there. No, the husband was there. And she goes, yeah, me and my husband want to come by and visit. And I'm thinking, why isn't the husband calling me? And then she asked me this. She goes, now let me ask you one more question, Pastor, before, before we get off the phone. She said this. She goes, what does my, what does my husband have to do to become, become a pastor? Because he wants to be a pastor. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, well, number one, you guys got to both be in church. Number two, that's a conversation I need to have with him. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now with this, oh yeah, of course, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I was just wondering, you know. Now she might be wearing a skirt, but I guarantee you she's the one wearing the pants in the family right, right. at the end of the day, okay? Now, shame on the man for allowing his wife to even get to that point, but you know what? It's still, the, 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 the fault that still falls upon the lady for even doing something like that, you know? And look, you might have been saved longer than your husband even. You know, that doesn't give you a right to, to, to disrespect him and downgrade him and make him feel like he's trash. Amen. You know, the Bible says you ought to reverence him, and it doesn't give a condition, well, if he's saved yep. or if he's not, or if he's a babe in Christ or if he's, like, God, godly, already godly. If he's read his Bible ten times, then you can reverence him. No, it just says reverence him. Yep. Bottom line, case closed. Don't disrespect him in, in public. And look, you want him to love you, well, give him a good reason to love you. Amen. You know, give him a good reason to love you. The fact that he, she reverences you, or excuse me, that you reverence him, that you follow him, that you respect his, his orders. This doesn't mean that he's going to be perfect. He's going to make a lot of mistakes. You talk to any husband, they'll tell you, we've all made bad mistakes, okay? And here's the thing. When we make mistakes, it's good to have a wife that's understanding of that and still is willing to follow us in spite of it. Amen. You know what that makes us want to do? It makes us want to love our wife even more. Amen. Say, man, I got me a good woman. Even in spite of how stupid I was, I made a bad decision, she still thinks I'm like the, like the godliest person on earth. You know what I mean? I got her that fooled, you know? <laughs> but the, the command is clear, you know? Right. Love your wives and wives. And look, often if there's a rift in marriage, it's because one of those two things are out of, uh, they're out of kilter, you know? And, it's, and you say, well, he does this and she does this. You know, why don't you examine yourself? You know, if there's, if there's a problem in your marriage, don't look to blame your wife. Don't look to blame your husband. Look to see what you're not doing. Yep. Like, man, am I loving my wife as I ought to? Or am I not reverencing my husband as much as I should? You know, and look, at the end of the day, does God know? God knows better than we do. His ways are higher than our ways. His ways are better than our ways. Yep. So we can't say, well, yeah, I've already reverenced him, so, but it doesn't work. No, you're lying. Yep. And you're calling God a liar. Because if he said it, then that means that works. Amen. You know, I had a lady tell me, oh, you know, no, it's all, I've had the meek and quiet spirit. I've had the meek and quiet spirit. You know, it just doesn't work. It's just like, and I tell her, I was like, so are you saying that God is lying then when he says that's the kind of spirit you ought to have? And here's the thing. The fact that she's like yelling that, I'm like, you're lying. You know what I mean? I got a meek and quiet spirit. Don't you see my meek and quiet spirit? It's like, no, you don't. Amen. You know? No, go to First Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. Now, not everyone is married in here, but Lord willing, everyone will get married in here. That's the goal, amen? And unfortunately, I've seen, man, I've had pastors just get up and just like talk bad about marriage. I don't know if you've ever heard something like that. They make fun of their wives behind the pulpit. They're like, it's just yeah. like, man, you make marriage sound like it sucks. Right. Like, man. You discourage people from getting married. And it's no wonder why the young people in the church don't want to get married. Because they look at the example of their pastors, it's like, well, if that's what marriage is like, I don't want it. You know? We ought to speak very highly. I love being married. Amen. I love being married. You know? I was content as a single person, but I love being married. And I don't say that to make any single guy feel bad. I'm telling you so you have something to look forward to. Yeah. 
Amen. So she's just like, man, I can't wait to get married because marriage is great. Now, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So it says there that the husband needs to dwell with his wife according to knowledge. What does that mean? You have to know your wife. Amen. You know, if she's crying and you don't know why, figure out why. Figure out what makes her sad. Figure out what makes her happy. Figure her out is what you need to do. You have to dwell with her according to knowledge. And look, the Bible says that she's a weaker vessel. That is true physically, but it's also true mentally and emotionally as well. Okay, so you can go like fast paced, 100, uh, you know, 100 miles an hour throughout the week, no sleep. You can just like conquer the devil and, you know, you know, preach against sodomites and, you know, conquer oneness and all these things. You're just like thriving off of it. Your wife may not be able to keep up with you at that pace. It might be a little, especially if they have kids, you know, they got the responsibility of the children. So they're a weaker vessel in that sense as well as being mentally, emotionally often weaker. OK, and you have to make sure that you are adapting to that and helping them with that and being patient with them in that regards. OK, now let me say this. One thing that will help you in your marriage. This sounds very um, basic, but it's true. And you talk to any person who's been successful at their marriage they will tell you that this is true. Being in church Amen. will help your marriage. Amen. You have to be in church. Good. And let me, let me make it clear. You have to be in church together. Okay. Right. That will help your marriage. Okay? And look, drag your behind in here if you have to with the bad attitude if you have to, but be in church. Good. You have to. You say, why is that? Because the, coming to church is a good habit to build within your marriage. Okay? It, it shows consistency. It shows that you, you're placing God at the most important aspect. And look, if you're not married yet, that's a good place to start as well. Amen. Don't miss church. Be in church. You know, I'll just listen to you guys on YouTube. That's not church. I'll just get the sermon, you know, on YouTube tonight or whatever. I just don't feel like going. You know, we got in a fight, so he's going to go to church, and I'm going to listen to it on YouTube. That's not church. Amen. Okay? You guys need to be in church together. Amen. It says here, finally, be of all one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. What does that mean? Be best friends. Yeah, your best friend ought to be your wife. Your wife's best friend ought to be you. That's how it ought to be. It says, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. So don't render evil for evil. You know, if your husband makes you feel bad, don't try to get back at him and vice versa. You know, see who has the last word in the argument or, you know, you won't cook him his favorite meal or what we're about to look at, you know, you, 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 don't, you, you don't partake in that physical relationship just to teach him a lesson. That's not what you do. In fact, the Bible says that's wicked and that's sinful Amen. to do something like that. It says don't render evil for evil, okay? Or railing for railing. You know, that's when you're arguing. You're like, well, you did this. Yeah, but remember five years ago when you did this? And the husband's like, I can't even remember what happened last week. <laughs> you're telling me about something five years ago? I thought you forgave me for that. Women don't forget anything. They have the memory of an elephant. Okay, they remember things from years past. But the Bible says right there, not railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Try to be a blessing to your spouse, knowing that you are there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. You say, well, what if I've been a blessing and they're just not changing? Then you're calling God a liar. Yep. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says that if you do these things, it will work. Do we, trust, do we not trust God? The Bible says it. Okay. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. So benevolence obviously is being kind, but in context of what we're reading here, it's talking about the physical relationship in marriage. Now, I'm going to be as appropriate as I can here, but the Bible speaks on this subject, okay? Verse 4 says, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband, hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So what is it saying here? It's saying, look, once you guys got married, the Bible says you're one flesh, right? And the Bible says that the woman's body now belongs to her husband and vice versa. That's right. Okay? So when you got married, according to the Bible, you consented 
to that physical relationship. But you know what we have today? We have spouses, specifically at times there's wives, who use that physical relationship as a tool to try to get what they want from their husband, to get, try to get them to behave in a certain way. That's wicked. Amen. When you got married, you consented to that relationship. And you know where adultery comes into play? When you defraud one another. Okay? When you say, well, you know, he, he, he went off and did this. Yeah, but you know what? A large portion of that, I'm not excusing any person who goes in to commit adultery. That's wicked. Amen. But the fact is, a lot of the times it's because the woman is actually defrauding the man. And sometimes vice versa. Yep. The Bible says don't defraud one another. And it says right there, except to be with consent. So you don't need consent to have that physical relationship. That happened when you guys got married. Yep. The consent is when you are to abstain from that for just a small period of time for prayer and fasting. Amen. Okay? And prayer and fasting does not typically a very long time you do that for. Okay? We won't get into that. And it says there, if you do, then Satan's going to tempt you for that. Satan will tempt your husband, he'll tempt your wife if you guys are not coming together on a regular basis, according to the Bible. Because that's part of marriage. That's inappropriate. That's part of marriage. The Bible says it. That's part of marriage. That's what God, look, it's not unholy to say that that's part, the physical relationship is part of marriage. That's part of marriage. God's blessed that. That's holy in the eyes of God. And the Bible says that the bed is undefiled. Okay? But you know what happens is that people, what does the fraud mean? It means cheat them. You know, no, the Bible says that your body doesn't belong to you anymore. I don't like that. Well, you know what? You've been too influenced by the feminist culture of this world. Amen. Okay. Or it's just like, you go, girl. You know, you got to do your thing. You know, hold, you know, if he if he's not behaving, you know, you got to you got to make sure you don't you don't give him what he wants. That's wicked. Amen. Okay. And Satan will destroy that marriage through you by doing that. Okay. Except to be with consent, the Bible says. So, let me see here. Look at verse number six. It says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So now, we, we, now he's starting to give commands to those who are married. But he's saying here, he says, specifically he says, look, now I'm giving this by permission, but it's not a commandment. What is he saying? This is something that's my judgment. It's not necessarily the Lord's commandment. Now, what Paul the Apostle is saying here, though, is true. Look at the latter end of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's see here. Where am I at? Verse number 40 says, But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. That's a good way to end it. He goes, by the way, I think I have the Spirit of God. Okay? In other words, he's making a good judgment. Okay? So though this is not the Lord speaking this, this is Paul the Apostle his opinion, he has the spirit of God. Therefore, we can adhere to what he's saying and say, hey, that's a good point. That's valid. Okay. So he says here in verse seven, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So what is he saying there in verse number seven? He says, it, in my opinion, it's good if everyone abides just the way I am. What is he talking about? Well, he's single. Yep. He's not married. And why is he saying that it's better for everyone to just abide the way he is? Simply because you could just do more for the Lord. Amen. Obviously, if you don't have a wife, you don't have kids, you don't have a lot of bills. Yep. You don't have more responsibility. So that will happen. Now you can uh, now you can tend to the things of the Lord without distraction. Okay, you can do, do a lot of soul winning. You can travel a lot more. You can just do a lot more. And he says, that's, that's good if you're able to do that. But then he says this, but every man hath this proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. What is it saying? That basically that gift that Paul has, some people have it, some people don't. And let me say this, it's a gift. Because sometimes people think, oh man, like no one wants to marry me. <laughs> like maybe I have the gift of like not marrying or something. Well, this is how you can test if you have that gift or not. Do you want to be married? If you're like, yeah, I do, then you don't have the gift. <laughs> That's the clear way you, how you can test that. Because a lot of singles go through that. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason, no one wants to marry you. Or I don't know what it is. You know, you know they just, you're just not finding someone. And you're like, man, I wonder if I'm just called to singleness. Well, if you have a desire to marry, that's a clear indication that you're not called to singleness. Now, I've met people who are called to singleness. Majority of the time, it's ladies that I've met personally. I haven't met a man as of yet who's called to singleness. Oh, I, I take that back. I know one person. 
Okay? And this person seems to be content just being single. I mean, he's, I want to say he's like 60 years old. He's never married once. And he doesn't have a problem just being single, working and doing the things of the Lord. And that's just how he's lived his whole life. You know, but that's not every guy. <laughs> you know, and I've met very far few and in between who are called to this. This is, a, this is the minority. Okay. Now he says there, so it's a gift. Okay. Verse number eight says, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. I've heard people try to use this as, we're going to get into divorce on this subject as well. But they'll use it as like, well, you know, if they can't, we can't contain, you know, we got divorced, we can't contain. Paul said we should just marry. That's not who it's talking to. It's not talking to divorced people. He says those who are unmarried and widows. We was like, well, I'm unmarried. But you were married before. <laughs> unmarried means like a single person who's never been married. And a widow is someone who their, their spouse died. Which according to Romans chapter number 7, now you can get married after they die. Okay, hopefully you didn't murder them or something like that to get out of that. And it says, if they can't contain, then let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. What is it talking about burning? It's talking about burning in lust. You know, you think of Romans chapter 1 where the Bible says that the homos, they burn in their lust one toward another. That's the same burning it's talking about, only it's talking about obviously a normal burning <laughs> towards the opposite gender. Okay, And it's saying there, you better marry because it's better to marry than to burn. Okay, And look, if you're burning, you're like, well, I can't find anybody. Well, maybe you need to mature a little bit. Amen. Maybe you need to grow up a little bit. Maybe you need to take on some more responsibility and be a man a little more. Okay, because look, there's a prepared place for prepared people, but you know what? There's prepared people for prepared people too. Amen. You know, if you prepare yourself, you're the man that, that, that is capable of sustaining a family, leading about a wife, having children, you know, God will probably send someone your way. Amen. But if you're immature, you're still acting like a kid, you know, you're probably not ready to get married yet. Because right. it takes a lot of maturity to be a husband. Because you know what it takes? It takes selflessness because you're taking care of someone else. No more late nights eating pizza at 12 o'clock and it's like, man, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get it. You could do that before. Go get some in and out at 1 o'clock in the morning if you want. Not when you're married, unless your wife goes with you. <laughs> but when you have kids, it's not like that. You know, now it's just like, you got to make sure you take care of this, 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 this clan right here. Okay? So if you want to marry, you say, well, I'm burning, so I need to get married. Okay, well, then why don't you grow up a little bit? Make sure you have a, a, a consistent job that can pay the bills, be a mature person. Because look, girls are often very mature. And often they, they, have, they have this tendency to mature a little faster than guys sometimes, at least from what I've seen. Okay? And they're looking for a mature guy. Amen. They're not going to marry some kid. <laughs> you know, if they want to get serious about the things of God, you need to grow up to prepare for that. Okay, and look, all guys at one point were immature, all right. But there comes a point where it's just like, all right, I need to get serious about the things of God. I need to get married, and I need to grow up. You know, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a, as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Yeah, yeah. Part of being a man is getting married, amen. And look, man, I was like, but then we're gonna, I'm gonna have to like get a second job, or I'm gonna have to like do all these, yeah. Yeah, we got to pay some bills, Amen. okay? But that's, that's an honor to be able to do that, okay? Now, but Paul's saying here, it's good to remain single. Now, why is he saying that? Now, skip down to verse number 32. It says, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Look at verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So he's saying, look, I'm glad I'm not married because I don't have any distractions. You know, he can just, uh, just dedicate all his time to the things of God, okay? Now, go look at verse number 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So this is very important, okay? So this is what God is commanding. He says, not me, God is commanding this. Verse 6 was Paul's opinion, but verse 10 is the commandment of the Lord, now, I think all of us can agree that it's important to adhere to the commandment of the Lord. Amen. Look at verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So he's saying, 
If you're married, don't depart from one another. Amen. We would call that divorce, yep. leaving each other. Now, we don't see that today. We see, even amongst Christians, Christians are just looking for any kind of excuse to get a divorce, right. to leave their wife or to leave their husband just because they had some fight, some tiff, just because they don't like that, you know, they, they leave their dirty socks somewhere in the living room or whatever. Some stupid little issue comes up and it's just like, I, I want a divorce, you know? And you know what the worst thing about this is? Is that pastors are getting up and they're condoning that garbage. Oh, right. Staff members are getting up in churches, discipling people, mm -hmm. telling them it's okay to get a divorce. Yep. True. I've heard it out of, from people's own mouths in that, respect, in that respect. Where it's just like, well, you know... Yeah, he committed fornication. Yeah, you know, you should probably, you know. Oh, he's in prison? Or your husband's in prison? Oh, he's a gangster? Yeah, you guys, you guys, you guys should get married. We'll, we'll lead you through the divorce process, and then you guys can get That's wicked as hell Amen. to do that. That shows you how much you esteem the covenant that they made before God. Okay? Marriage is holy. All right? And look, you don't have to turn to Malachi 2.16. It says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Putting away means divorce, okay? And God is saying here that he hates it. Amen. I mean, that's strong language right there. He goes, I just want to let you guys know, I hate divorce. Oh, but you don't know my situation. Did he say there, <laughs> in case it's your own situation? You know, does he say there, you know, just, but in this regard, not, nah, you know, if, if it's your situation, depending on your situation, it, it depends, but... You know, I only hate it every once. No, he just says, I hate it. Amen. I hate putting away. And look, when you're married, you should never use the D word. Amen. I'm not talking about damn. I'm talking about divorce. Amen. That should never come up in a conversation. I don't care how bad the fight gets, how bad you disagree with your spouse, how fast she can fling a broom at you or whatever it is. Divorce should never be mentioned. Amen. But you know what we have today? We have a bunch of Pharisees who are looking for a cause to get divorced right, right, right. for any reason, you know, just because he's not, he, he wasn't what he was before you guys got married. She's not what she was before you guys got married. You know, she gained a little weight, which newsflash, when they get married, they have to gain weight. Amen. That's part of life. Yeah. Doesn't mean she's an ugly person. Doesn't mean she's an evil, wicked person. It's just life. And guess what? You'll probably gain some of that weight too. <laughs> Yeah. And you don't even have the baby. <laughs> so check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah. But you know what? That's, that's what we see today, don't we? True. I've heard of situations where a guy left his wife because he's just no longer attracted to her anymore. Pastor who did that. Yeah. Wow. Just because she gained weight because they had three beautiful children. What do you expect? Wow, right? She's bearing your children. Yeah. And what a shallow person... To no longer feel attracted to your wife just because she gained some weight. Well, you have a shallow view of your wife. Amen. You know, it ought to be that when someone gets married, you know, obviously you're attracted. I'm attracted to my wife physically. But you know what? It goes deeper than that after a while. Because guess what? Lord willing, if you guys grow old together, you guys are going to be both wrinkly and old. Yeah. <laughs> and at that point, the looks don't matter. Amen. You know, you got to love them for their soul, for their personality, for who they are. Not because of what they look like. Beauty is skin deep, okay? But it's true. You know, a shallow person is the one who's constantly looking at the outward appearance. And, you know, they gain a little bit of weight. Or, you know, they, their bad habits start fleshing out. And you're just like, oh, this, I don't, you know, who are you? You know, you're not the person I, I knew before. That's garbage. You, didn't, you need to grow up is what you need to do, Okay. That's not the, the commitment that you made when you made that covenant. It's still death do you part. Amen. Okay, it's, it's saying, you know what? When you grow fat, when you grow ugly, I'm still committing to you. You're mine, I'm yours, till death do us part, no matter what happens. Amen. Okay, now, so divorce is never, accept, is never an option. Now, here's the thing. Now, obviously, people are going to get divorced. Okay. If not, God wouldn't have talked about it. But people get divorced. It's, is it right? No, it's not right. Amen. Okay. But if they depart, 
If he or she divorces, which is still sinful, what does the Bible say you should do? So the Bible even tells us what we ought to do if that took place where someone were to get divorced. Now, let me just, before I, I continue there, just want to let you know, I, if you've been divorced before, I'm not against you. Amen. I'm not preaching against you. I don't hate you. Our church does not hate you. Amen. I'm preaching to the people who have not gotten married, and I'm preaching to the people who have gotten married, and maybe they're going through a little rough situation right now, and they're possibly considering divorce. Amen. Okay, that's who I'm talking to. And if you've been divorced and you agree with me, you ought to be amening this. Amen. Say, hey, that's true. Amen. Yeah, don't do it. So the Bible tells us what to do if that happens. Verse, verse 11. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or let her find another husband. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. So it says, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. You see, a lot of people, when they get divorced, the reason they're getting divorced is because they already got their eye on someone else. Right. I don't love them anymore, so who do you love now? You know, it's not because all, you know, they're pulling out all kinds, of, all kinds of trash on their spouse, and the reason why is because they're already looking for someone else. Right. Well, the Bible says there, look, okay, if you've messed up, you've divorced, you've done wrong, you've sinned, okay, what's done is done. Here are your two options. Remain unmarried. Don't marry again. Or, here's the better one, is this. Go be reconciled to your husband. In other words, Amen. go get married to your own husband. Now, if you get divorced and you marry another person, the Bible calls, that, the Bible calls divorce adultery, just in general. Okay? But if you marry another person, you cannot go back to your original husband. Okay? And there's a, there's a whole sermon we can preach on that, but we're not going to get into that for, just for the sake of time. But it says there, let her remain unmarried and be reconciled to her husband. Let not the husband put away his wife. So those are the only two options. Amen. It's not like, well, you know, just go find someone else. You know, no, it says be reconciled to your husband. Amen. Okay. And most of the time, the reason people want to get married is because they want to get married to someone else. You know, they, they want to use this, but they don't, want to, they don't want to talk about verse 11 where it says be reconciled to your husband or stay unmarried. Right. Yeah, yeah. Verse 27, look at verse 27. It says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But that's not the case today. The case we see today is that people are getting divorced left and right, and, and they're, they're looking for someone else is what they're doing. Okay. Now go to Luke chapter 16. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And look, if someone gets divorced, obviously it's, it's wicked, but it's not perpetual adultery if, they, if they've gotten divorced. Amen. Okay, what's, what's done is done. You know? So they're not in, per, in perpetual sin. If they've recognized it, it's, they, it's wrong, and they want to get it right, they're not in perpetual sin if, they're, if they've been divorced before. All right? But now they made a commitment to this person. Hey, stay with that person. Amen. You know? And look... One reason that our church believes this, obviously because it's biblical, but secondly, because we care about the next generation. Amen. You know, my dad, he's not saved, and, but he, I, I, I esteem him as a, a responsible man. He's a man whom I love. He's a man who I believe loves me. And, you know, he, he left our home long ago when I was a kid. But, you know, obviously, after I got saved, we reconciled the relationship and, you know, he sees that I'm a Christian. He sees that I'm living for the Lord. All these things. I remember when I got married, when I was about to get married, he was just like thrilled to death. And I remember he told my aunt, he says, hey, are you coming for my son's wedding? She goes, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. And he says, look, my son is getting married. And Lord willing, this is the only time he will ever get married. Amen. He goes, you need to be here for this special occasion. He was thrilled to death. The fact that his son was getting married and that I was making a commitment to stay with one woman forever. Amen. That's an honor for a father. And you know what? I want to be honored like that to have my son grow up and say, hey, one woman and one woman only for the rest of my life. That's right. You know, but that doesn't happen by osmosis. Amen. You know, we need to talk about it. We need to preach about it. We need to teach them. We need to teach our church the divorce is wicked and is wrong. Look at Luke 16, verse 18. It says, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth 
adultery. Now go to Matthew chapter 19. So it says there clearly, it's adultery. Amen. Now I've heard people say this, yeah, but you know, there's an escape clause in that commandment though. There's a little asterisk in that commandment though. I've heard people literally say this. I helped the guy get out of adultery and then some assistant pastor came to him and, he, and the guy went up to him and said, hey, I didn't know that this was what the Bible says. He goes, I'm, in, I'm involved in adultery. I need to get out of this relationship. And the guy said, yeah, that's good, that's good, you know. And he said, um, but there's an escape clause in there. There's a little asterisk, I'll show you later. He didn't even know where it was. <laughs> The so-called escape clause, asterisk. And then the guy came up to me after and he goes, hey, brother so-and-so said that there's like an asterisk, there's like a, a escape clause or something to that? I said, what? <laughs> no. I was like, where? He goes, he couldn't show me. I was like, let me show you what, I, what he's talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And let me show you that it's not an escape clause. Okay. Matthew 19 verse 3 says, the Pharisees came, also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So what are they looking at? They want to, look, they want to be able to divorce for any reason. Like, can we, can we like get divorced for like any reason? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that which he made, uh, uh, that which, excuse me, that he, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So he says, look, what does that mean? No. Amen. Let no man put asunder. Amen. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto him, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. Ah, there you go. There's the escape clause right there. Asterisk, whatever that guy said. And shall marry another, committeth adultery. Whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. He said, well, it says right there, Bruce. Except it be for fornication. The only problem with that is, is that married people can't commit fornication. Amen. You guys know the difference? <laughs> Adultery is between two married people. Fornication is between two people who are not married. Amen. So he's saying there, except to be for the cause of fornication, which is not something that married people can do. Because at that point, it becomes adultery. Amen. You say, well, what is it talking about? It's talking about the betrothal. When, you, when, they, when, they're, when they've made that commitment to get married, but they have not consummated that marriage, they have not come together, he finds out, for example, Joseph and Mary... She found out that she was with child. And of course, it was, it was the Lord. And he was minded, being a just man, he was minded to put her away privily. Okay? Put her away, in other words, it was, it was what we would call an annulment today. Yep. Okay? To say, okay, well, she, she committed fornication before we were even able to consummate the marriage. So therefore, I'm going to give her a, a, an annulment, a writing of divorcement, which we can see that back in the Old Testament that that was actually justifiable. Yep. Okay? So it's saying they're accepted to be for fornication. But do we see that today, that that's why people get divorced? I mean, they've been married for years. Right. And it's just like, well, he was watching porn or whatever. You know, he, he, he did this or he did that. I want a divorce. Does it say that? Nope. Or he's fornicating. He's not. How do you, He's married. That's impossible. Okay. And look, I remember I asked this in the Spanish ministry. I was like, do you guys know the difference between fornication and adultery? Uh, oh, I said, is adultery and fornication the same thing? And they all said, yes. <laughs> well, the reason for it is because the Spanish Bible renders it as such. Just like the other versions of the Bible, by the way, the perversions of the Bible. I'm like, no. Here's the difference. Adultery is actually punishable by death. <laughs> That's a big difference. <laughs> okay. So there goes your escape clause. There goes your asterisk. And unfortunately, the guy he wanted to do right, and, and, and I told him, I said, look, this is what the Bible says. He even told me himself. He said, Brother Bruce, I read Proverbs 6 and 7 this morning. He said, that's her. <laughs> I was like, I mean, what? I said, what, what, what do you say? I'm like, amen? Or yeah. like, what part? You know, like, what do you? He says, that's her. Now, obviously, he's been with her for quite some time, so there's obviously some, some emotional attachment there. 
And he, but once he found out, he like departed. I mean, he was like done. He didn't even have a place to live. That's how bad he, that's, that's how much he wanted to get right with God. Amen. Well, this guy caused him to stumble. And guess what? Now he's back at that relationship again. Because he said, okay, you know, that's good. But do you still love her? He's like, well, yeah, I care for her. He goes, well, you, you willing to make this thing work out? And he's like, well, I mean, yeah, I guess. You know, if you have a religious leader consenting to this, he's going to give in to that. He's a, he was a baby in Christ. It's wicked. Amen. Okay? And look, we won't spend too much time on that, but, but the fact remains is that, you say, well, what's the, what's the message? The message is this. Divorce is never, never Amen. permitted in the Bible. Amen. Never, ever permitted in the Bible. Amen. Okay? All by you. And here's the thing. This is the, this, is the, this is the popular phrase that I hear today when a woman wants to divorce her husband. I just think he's reprobate, though. Oh, you think he's reprobate? Why is that? Oh, because you know, he's watching porn or something. Look, I don't know your husband, but the fact remains is that it takes a lot. Obviously, it takes you rejecting Christ, but people can get pretty far before they become a reprobate. Think of Paul, the apostle. Blaspheme, he was injurious. You know, he's persecuting the church. You know, obviously, he did it ignorantly and unbelief. That's why he obtained mercy. But you know what? That's an excuse is what it is. Because yeah. they, want, they want the leaders of our churches, the new IB, to say, oh, yeah, if that guy's reprobate, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, definitely. No, no, you know? And that's just an excuse. You're making things up. You need to work it out Amen. is what you need to do. Okay, look, let's read on. Verse 12 says, To the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So again, now he says, now to the rest, I'm speaking here, not the Lord. Now remember, Paul the Apostle has the spirit of the Lord. Amen. So what he's saying, I think is still correct. Verse 13, and the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So it's telling us there, even if they're not saved, don't leave them. Amen. I've had ladies come up to me and tell me that as well. Oh, we're unequally yoked together. You know, now that we're married and stuff, and you know, so I don't think this is like legitimate because he's an unbeliever and I'm a believer. Well, you know, you made your bed, <laughs> now sleep in it. Amen. You know, it looks like you didn't care when, when you guys were having that relationship in the first place. Right. But now that the honeymoon's over, <laughs> now you're pulling out that car that he's an unbeliever. Well, it says right here, don't, don't put them away just because they're an unbeliever. Verse 14 says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So, you know, use that as an opportunity to be able to win your husband to the Lord. Amen. To win your wife to the Lord. Because here's the thing. Now as a husband, if you're saved and your wife's not saved, you have God's Spirit in you. You have the Bible. You know how to love with the love of God. Amen. You know how to be long-suffering and patient. You can woo your wife with the Lord, okay? Because now you have, you know what the Bible says, how to be kind and to be benevolent and to, and to win your wife over. Amen. Same thing with the wife. Look, you, you say, well, he's, he's, he's just an unbeliever. Well, you know what? There's principles in the Bible where you can win your husband to the Lord because you're reverencing him. You have a, a, a quiet and meek spirit. You know, you're loving him. You're respecting him. You can win him over. Amen. Verse 15 says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. And they like to use that verse, don't they? But this is what they mean by this, okay? Chad, why don't you come up here? Stand right here. So th what they're saying is this. Well, you know, if the unbelieving depart, you know, let him depart. This is what the Bible says. If, he's, if, if she's like, I don't want you, I'm getting divorced. Obviously, you can't force anybody to stay with you. So depart, t depart, just walk away. That's what the Bible's saying, but come back. But this is what they're doing. When they say, when they see, when the, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart, they're helping them depart. They're like, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, if the unbeliever depart, depart. That's what they mean. So you know what they do? They become this evil witch to give that man an excuse to leave. That's what they mean by that. You know, no, I'm a, I'm a meek and quiet woman. Yeah, most of the time it's the woman helping the, woman, the, the man to depart is what it is. And it says here, but if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But look what it says. But God hath called us to peace. So why don't they use that part of the verse 
to use. Right. Well, what is he saying? But God calls us to peace. Well, verse 11 says, be reconciled to your husband. So what's the, what's the synonym for peace? To reconcile. Amen. So he says, look, if they, believe, if they depart, let them depart. But you know what? God's called us to peace. That means you should do everything in your power Amen. to reconcile that relationship with your husband or with your wife. Amen. I mean, just everything in your power to win your wife back. Everything in your power to win your husband back. Do everything you possibly can to keep that marriage going. Amen. He said, well, what if I just die trying? Then you die trying knowing that you please the Lord by obeying His commandment. Amen. But you know what? It'll work. It will work. You know, you ask my mother-in-law, she's dealt with multiple cases just like this, where she, she's like, just do this, do this, and try to win him back, try to do this. It works. And God's called us to peace. God's, you should do whatever you can in your power to try to reconcile that relationship. No matter what it takes, do what you can. Verse 11, or excuse me, verse 16 says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? How do you know you're not going to save them? I mean, why would you let them depart? Look, that's a soul that can get saved through you. Amen. You could potentially save your spouse. Verse 17, but as God hath distributed to every man as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being, un, uh, being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keep, keeping of the commandments of God. Now, what, what does he mean by that? What I believe he's talking about right there is this. Because when people get saved, they get saved at different stages of life sometimes. Some people get saved being single. Some people get saved and they're already married. You know, they get, maybe they get saved, their spouse is not married. Or maybe they get saved and they've already been divorced. You know? So what is he saying there? He's saying, look, if any man being called circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised. And he says that circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but the, the keeping of the commandments of God. So in other words, it's like this. It's not about where they're at. It's about where they're going. Amen. You know? If you made the mistake of getting a divorce in the past, that's in the past. Yeah. You know what's important now? That you keep the commandments of God. That's right. Amen. Okay. If you made mistakes in the past, you fornicated in the past, you did something wrong in the past, put the past behind you, but keep the commandments of God now. Because obviously we don't live in a perfect world, so people who come to our church, they're not all going to come unmarried and never been divorced and never been involved in fornication. No, because we're preaching the gospel, we're going to keep reaching a lot of people. And they're going to come from different walks of life. And we need to teach them, hey, you know, if you've been divorced, we, you know, this is what the Bible says against, uh, about divorce. We're not against you or anything, but you can still serve God. You can stu still do something great for God. You can still be used of God mightily. Okay. Let's read on here. Verse 20 says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he, wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is, is Christ's servant. That's applicable to the person who's been divorced. Look, if you, if you got saved and you were divorced, just remain that way. That's part of the commandment, right? To remain unmarried. But guess what that, can, that person could do now? Now he can dedicate all his time to the Lord. Yeah. She can dedicate all her time to the Lord. Okay? And look what it goes on to say. It's verse 23. Ye are bought with the price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose therefore that it, that, excuse me, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned as if, uh, and if a virgin marries, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now, this is another portion of scripture that people who want to excuse divorce use. Okay. This is what my interpretation of this verse means. Again, what is it in context of where you're called? So I think that verse 27 obviously is referring to those who are married. Verse 28 is still referring to those who are not married. Yep. He goes, but if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. He said, well, how do you know it's not referring to a person who's been divorced? Because if they, if they divorce, guess what? They've sinned. Yeah. Yeah, right. 
You know, and if they get married again, they've sinned. Amen. But it says here, if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, yeah, we're telling you to abide where you're at when you're called. But if you haven't been divorced, you can get married and you're not sinning by doing that. Amen. Okay. And if a virgin marries, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. What does that mean? You know, in marriage, there's trouble. Okay. It's just, you know, you go through trials, you go through uh, different uh, I was going to say uh, tribulations. We don't want to go that deep into it. But, you know, there, there's bumps in the road yeah. in marriage, okay? So just because you get married, that doesn't solve all your problems. Sometimes guys think, well, you know, I just need to get married. And, you know, everything's going to be hunky-dory and roses and daisies. Yeah, you know, being married is great. But that doesn't mean it doesn't come with its share of problems as well. Amen. Okay, it's going to come with pr problems. And it's going to mature you. I, uh, my wife's uncle used to say that marriage is God's chisel. <laughs> You know, just chiseling away at you, you know what I mean? Why? Because now you're living with someone who's different than you, yeah. who has different habits than you, you know, and you have to, you have to live with that, right? Or you have, to, you have to learn how to work around that is what I'm saying, all right? I'm out of time. We're not going to be able to finish this chapter here. But what's the, what's the message tonight? The message is this. If you get nothing out of this, get this. God hates divorce. Amen. And you, if you're married, may that never come into your mind that potentially you should get divorced because you hit a little bump in the road. You know, especially if you're the man. Don't be a weakling. Yeah. Amen. Okay? Don't be some soft, snowflake weakling who can't take a week of trials with your wife. Right. And that would cause you to just want to throw in the towel. You're weak if you, if you do that. Yeah. Okay? Man up. Get some stones. And fix the problem. You know, you ought to be the guy who creates the solution in your family. Be a leader in your family. Wear the pants in your family. Amen. And say, man, my family is in disarray right now, but you know what? I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to handle, I'm the leader of my home. I'm the head of my wife, of my children. I'm going to fix the situation. Okay? Don't be some sissy where it's just like, I can't do this. My wife doesn't love me anymore. You know, man up. Amen. Amen. You know, if she doesn't love you, then be lovable. <laughs> you know, be a strong leader. You know, brush your teeth or comb, do whatever you got to do. It's because it's, it's your fault, you know, at the end of the day, because you're the leader. Okay. And remember, just remember this. It's cool to say, yeah, I'm the head of the house. But that comes with the responsibility and everything rises and falls on leadership. That's right. So if the, if the course goes well... Praise God for you. If it goes bad, that's your fault. You need to fix it. And it should never be an option to say, well, maybe I should get a divorce. Maybe, you know, maybe I can choose one of these girls from the new IFB who is a little, who's read their Bible like 15 times or something. My wife, she just does not want to read her Bible. Well, that's your fault. Amen. You know, why don't you teach your wife how to read the Bible? Amen. You know, why don't you spend some time with your wife showing her doctrine and praying with your wife? And being patient with your wife and bringing her along. At the end of the day, yeah, you know what? These commandments are also for the women. But you know what? More so, it's for the man. Man up. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for 1 Corinthians 7. And I pray that you would help us to raise a generation in our church here of people who hate divorce. And also of people who love their marriage, love their wives, love their, their, their husbands, love their children. And that our children in the next coming generation would have these, these Christian biblical values that, and that they would have adhere to it uh, wholeheartedly, Lord. Please give us the strength, Lord. And we know there's bumps in the road, but that's just going to help us the more. It's going to cause us to pray more, to read the Bible more, to just mature more as well. And I pray that we not get discouraged when we hit those bumps in the road. May that be a sign to us that we need you and to uh, call, call out to you and ask you to help us to lead our homes. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>